Six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Those who survived had to rebuild their lives, many of them here in the U.S. Now, more than seven decades later, few of them remain. Recently, a New York City photographer set out to take pictures of as many survivors who are still here as possible. The result is a stunning book of portraits that captures the resiliency of their generation. Every survivor, if you're going to ask them, how did you survive? Everyone will use only one word, and that is luck. There is no rhyme, there is no reason why somebody lived, somebody died. These are the faces of men and women who survived the Holocaust. How did they get there? Where did they come from? That those stories are reflected sometimes in their faces. Their eyes witnessed unthinkable evil. I don't know if it's a curse or a blessing, but I could see it how it was. I remember every little detail. This is a generation growing older. The size of the group is getting smaller. So Brian Marcus decided to capture them in photographs. I think the faces tell their own stories. The photographs themselves, um, to me, show resiliency and strength. Brian is known as one of the top wedding photographers in New York City. He's also the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. My grandfather's name was Fred Marcus. He was special in, in, in so many ways, but most importantly, he had just a, a wonderful, boisterous personality. There's definitely something about Fred Marcus that so many people remember, and it's, uh, it's nice that he was, he was mine. Fred was born to a Jewish family in Breslau, Germany in 1910. He grew up as the Nazis rose to power. In 1938, Fred was taken to Buchenwald, a concentration camp in eastern Germany. There was a brief period with anybody who had bookings to go to, I guess, the United States or to Cuba or outside of Germany uh, was let out of the concentration camps, depending on what their job was. Fred took a ship bound for Cuba, and when he got there, fell in love with the art of photography. Really started taking pictures of people on the beaches there. All he had was a camera and some, some clothing. Um, had no prior experience. He later made it to New York City, opening Fred Marcus Photography on the Upper West Side. This is nice. Where his son Andy and Brian still work. Fred passed away in 2001. As much time as I spent with him and as close as we were, you know, there was something inside of me that, that really wished that I had spent even more time learning about his story. And so that really inspired me to learn about other people's stories. So to honor his grandfather's memory and generation, Brian started taking photographs of Holocaust survivors and liberators. And just chin down a little bit. We just, uh, through word of mouth, uh, started these sort of these small groups of portrait sessions. And after doing four or five in my own studio, I realized that this was something a little bit more, a little bit more important to go out and, and try to put together a book uh, that had as many survivors that were still here. In the end, he had 167 portraits, all of them featured in a book called Still Here. With everything that they've gone through, they are still here and they'll always be here. My name is Ellie Gross. I was born February 14, 1929, Shimleo Silvaniei in Romania, in the Northern Transylvania. In 1929 was recession around the world in Romania too, and it was a market full with food, but people had no work, no money to buy it, and it was easy to blame the Jews. I was attending kindergarten, and they called me, Dirty Jew, go to Palestine. In September 1939, the Second World War started. For Jews, it was every day, the life got worse and worse. In 1942, every man was drafted to forced labor. My father was 36 years old. I never saw him again. In 1944, we had to wear the Yellow Star of David. Jews were beaten, spit, and stoned on the street. In April of 1944, Ellie, her mother, and five-year-old brother Adalbert were forced from their home. We had a beautiful house. We had to leave it. I didn't want to leave it. The next month, deportations began. The transport started on May 27 and halted on June 2, 1944. We were seven days with no food and water. I 
hear all my, the echo, how children were crying for food, and mothers had not even water to give them. There was no place to sit. My mom, I was sitting between mom legs, and my brother between my leg, and he didn't, I never forgot. He never asked anything. He just was holding my neck, and that's, and how old was he at the time, your brother? Five. He was so cute, little boy. He was so smart. He would have been a genius. The cattle cars arrived at Auschwitz in Poland, the largest Nazi concentration camp in Europe. An estimated 1.3 million people were sent to Auschwitz between May 1940 and May 1945. Over a million were killed. It was such a terrible memory also that when they ordered us to get out. In front of the cattle car was a uh, cart pulled by men, and the dead, the who couldn't walk, the children, the sick was thrown on top of each other. It was such an unhuman thing. And the, from far away, I saw chimneys with ashes and fire, and it was a heavy rubber smell. The Jews were ordered into two groups. Just wave with a glove like this. I was the one who was waved to the right side. I am here. I remember how I was running when I was waved with the officer with the white gloves and a soldier pushed me and they, I had to run to catch the others. I remember how I was running. My mother and my brother. Her mother and brother were sent to the left. So my mom, she carried my brother. Then they told us to jump off because my brother had no more strength to stand on his foot. I started to cry. Where is my mother and brother? They told me that someday you meet on the family reunion. I was a stupid 15 years old. I believed it, always waited. Ellie never saw her mother or brother again. She was the only member of her family who survived. For decades, she never spoke about her pain or her loss until 1998, when she attended the March of the Living, an educational program at Auschwitz. There, she saw a photo that she had never seen before. This photo of her mother and brother right before they were sent to death. I made a commitment. That commitment to share her family's story so it won't be forgotten. I'm Norbert Strauss, N-O-R-B-E-R-T. I'm born in a small town north of Frankfurt, a town by the name of Bad Homburg. My brother and myself, I guess around uh, three or four years old, the two of us. Norbert Strauss was born in 1927 and was just a child during Hitler's rise to power. And I always ask everybody, can you find me on the picture? Nobody could find me, but it's really very easy. Just look for the one person who has a tie on. That's this person. That's, that's me. That's you right there. Yes, that's right. Germany became increasingly unsafe for Jews in the late 1930s. Norbert's father set out to get a new life ready for the family in New York. Meanwhile, time was running out for Norbert, his brother, and his mother. German Jews were being deported to concentration camps. And the only way at that point of leaving uh, Germany was a train which the Nazis allowed to leave Germany into France, one train a month, if you had a visa. We didn't have a visa, but one day uh, the Gestapo officer says to my mother, uh, if you have any money left, uh, I can get you airplane tickets to fly out of Germany. And the decision was that if we don't do anything, we are just waiting to be transported out. She went to the police, she gave the Gestapo officer the money, expecting that maybe as soon as he has the money, he would turn around and have arrested. Nothing happened. He took the money. He said, come back next week. I'll have tickets for you. Next uh, week, my mother went back, and the police officer handed her three airplane tickets. Lufthansa, the same airline that flies today, to, to leave from, uh, from Munich on uh, January 6, I think it was, 1941. Miraculously, Norbert and his family made it to France, then to Spain, and finally to Portugal, where they boarded a ship to New York. A new life, but the pain of his childhood stayed with him. All we knew as children was Germany and what had happened to us and the, and the constant fear of being beaten up, 
uh, by the Hitler Youth. We did not know what it meant to be free. All I knew was fear. And it continued even for many years after I came to, to the United States. Whenever I would walk on the street, I would see a bunch of kids coming. I would feel I have to cross the street or I have to run. Norbert went on to fight for the U.S. Army, working his way up to the rank of sergeant. He later graduated from City College in 1949. Now 89 years old, Norbert works as a volunteer at Englewood Hospital in New Jersey, logging tens of thousands of hours of volunteer work. The secret to living a good life, which is satisfying and rewarding, is to give back. Giving is one of the ways to pay back to society for the United States giving me a home. My name is Sammy Steigman. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I'm also a child of Holocaust survivors. I was born in Chernobyl. As a matter of fact, officially, I was born in three different countries. So when I was born, Chernovitz belonged to Romania. Later it became part of the former Soviet Union. And today in my passport, it says that I was in Ukraine. When I look at the picture, you know, uh, I always smile. I remember the warmth, uh, the security that I felt at home. This is my parents, their wedding picture in 1934. My mother's name is Regina. My father's name was Nathan. In 1941, when Sammy was just a year and a half, he and his parents were forced from their home. I was with my parents in a labor camp named Mogile Podolsk. A lot of people died of starvation. People were beaten to death. And some of them were just shot to death or worked to death. Sammy and his parents were liberated in 1944. The Soviets allowed a small group of Jews, approximately 3,000, to go back to the country of origin. We settled here in the small town Regin, and that's where I grew up. From my father's side, from approximately 35 close family members, only two survived. Throughout his childhood, Sammy says he struggled with intense pain in his neck and shoulders, but never complained. I'm coming from a generation that was not allowed to cry, and that was very stoic, and did not show pain. Until one day in his late 20s, Sammy told his parents about the pain. I was not able to hide it from my parents. Inadvertently, my father told me that I was subjected to medical experiments. So that was the first time that I was became aware of it. During World War II, experts say there were physicians who conducted painful and often deadly experiments on thousands of Jewish prisoners, including children. As a Holocaust survivor, I cannot imagine the inhumanity of men towards men. For most of his life, Sammy never spoke about what happened to him or his family. He says he felt caught between two generations, survivors and children of survivors. That changed about 15 years ago when he was invited to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. There were over 8,000 people from all over the world. And at the table where I'm sitting, I met a man born in the same city, been in the same camp, the same years, for the first time I met somebody like me. I felt that I belonged to both generations. I did not have to ignore it anymore. He decided to start sharing his story with students. They sent me thank you letters. And one of the sixth graders wrote, your story was overwhelming. I promise I'll pass your story to my children. When I saw the impact that I have in young people, I have decided to dedicate the rest of my life to reach as many young people as I can. This book is dedicated to my grandfather, Fred Marcus, whose strength and spirit has always inspired me. His triumph and the triumph of all those represented in this volume will serve as a living legacy for all whose voices were silenced by the Holocaust and those who miraculously endured. Turn your body just a little bit this way. In putting together the book, Brian worked with author June Hirsch, who interviewed each person photographed. I learn so much more 
from speaking to these individuals, then honestly, I think I could learn from reading a thousand books. Next to every photo is a quote from those interviews. Many of them made the comment, whether it's in the book or it was just personally made to me, that their greatest revenge for what they endured is living a good life. I really feel like I honored my grandfather, first and foremost. Um, that was what I set out to do. I know he's looking down and, and proud. For many Holocaust survivors and their families, there's a saying passed down through generations, never forget. And because of still here, we will always remember their struggles, their pain, and their perseverance. I'm from the generation that is the last generation that can speak about what happened to me, what happened to us. Once this generation is gone, if it isn't recorded and brought forward to the next generation, it's going to be lost.